Hey, how you doing? Welcome to uh, episode 59 of the Notcast. And uh, previous ones I've brought up recently haven't been around one specific subject as such. I haven't been talking through a band or an album or anything like that. All that is going to change today. I'm going to go back to a band which you may think I might actually like. Um, you too. And today I'm going to be talking about their umpteenth studio album that was released in 2004, How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. Um, this one might be quite long. I might break it into two parts to talk through the tour and the associated releases that, that follow that up. Um, but uh, I, I, I listened to this today on, on a record player and uh, it's really shut up in my estimations today. Normally I, I have opinions and ideas about an album and I stick with them and I don't really tend to change my mind. But I listened to it today and, and I saw the album in a new light. Probably, pardon me, because of overexposure to something makes you feel a little bit dry and a little bit dull and a little bit numbed to it. And sometimes you need to go back and experience something after having had a break. Um, now, much as I love Star Wars, if I watched Star Wars every week, I'd get to the point where even the most fantastic things that happened in Star Wars would be dull and dry. And I'd be like, oh, just the Death Star exploding, just all the rest. Oh, no big deal. Um, it's been a couple of years since I've listened to How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. And I came back to it again. It's really shut up in my estimations. Um, so we need to do a little bit of history around what was happening in the band at the time. Um, and bring you up to the album's release, and I'm going to talk through the album and why I think it's such a, a, a great, great choice. So, so first things first, um, we're just coming off the back of the best of uh, 90 to 2000. So at the end of, of the year 2002, um, the band had done The Hands That Built America, which had been nominated, I think, for an Oscar from the soundtrack to the film Gangs of New York. Um, they performed at the Oscars, but they weren't successful. And the band went into the studio to record a new album. Um, which was going to be called How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. They had a number of songs that they'd recorded for it, um, and they were all ready and, and set to release either late 2003, early 2004. And then probably during the recording, there was one point they were recording and that they kind of they sent the orchestra away that was going to orchestrate, presumably, Original of the Species, because they played the song for the orchestra, and they said the orchestra looked bored. And if the orchestra looked bored, then the song isn't really there. Um, there, there's a fair bit of discussion in, in the book, YouTube or YouTube, um, where they talk through the recording of the album. I have, of course, um, got some pages ready here. And they, they talk through kind of what, what went wrong, really. Um, but uh, I've got to find the relevant part. Um, so by the end of 2003, they decided that they weren't going to release the album. Um, they had an album, all the components part were there. But as Larry d described it, it, it just wasn't there. The songs had a lot of things going for them, but they had no magic. And uh, the thing that separates the, the ordinary from the extraordinary. And um, I think uh, Edge, Edge described it as, you know, that the air leaked out of the balloon and we suddenly hit the ground. And they worked the guts out of nine months um, with, with the producer and uh, they, they couldn't get anywhere. And while I said the, the whole was starting to sound like the sum of the parts, that's the difference between math and magic. And you start realising, wow, everything's in, in, in place, but it's not special. And sometimes, you know, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. When you're experiencing a song, you don't necessarily think that just, I mean, if you listen to a song and it's compulsive multi-tracks, and you listen to just the drums or just the bass or just the guitar or just the vocals, and you go, this isn't that good. But then you put them all together and a magic happens. And that only really comes from getting the ingredients correct and in, in the right proportion. Uh, and this this is this is kind of what happened uh, with with the album for this as well is that they, they they went back they were probably about 24 hours away from saying right we finished the album and they took a step and they decided no that they weren't going to commit to releasing that album they were going to go back into the studio they're going to re-record and remix the songs and they went back in with i think daniel lanois and uh, steve lillywhite they re-recorded a number of songs they completely rethought some of the others um, and I'm going to, going to mention that you can hear an alternate version of the album if you uh, if you know where to look. Um, and so what what he did is that, you know, the Steve Lillywhite came in and helped the band finish the album. And he, he said, you need to record in a different room. So they moved from one room in a studio to a different studio. And they came back and they had another look at it. And sometimes that's exactly what you need to do. Uh, 
And, and Larry says, you can argue that too many cooks spoil the broth, but it was a very productive time um, as we were, we just kind of put, so they had one session, I think, where they put together a number of songs uh, without Bono being there during the recording. And I think songs like, um, I think, let me see if I can find the section here. Um, Miracle Drug, for example, um, and Vertigo got reworked and, and some of the other songs came back together. So City of Blinding Lights, for example. And then, then what you end up with is, is actually a different kind of song completely, um, a different kind of album. And um, so uh, also All Because of You and I think maybe A Man and a Woman. And those songs all, all came together kind of relatively quickly without Bono being around who then put, put vocals into it. Um, it's it's an interesting album, and without wishing to get too deep into the detail about why the album didn't work in 2003, I'm going to show you a picture from the Anton Corbin book, uh, which is this is going to be probably the last appearance this book makes in the series, um, and these were you know photos which were going to be used for the covers, and, and you know clearly you can look at it, but it doesn't look strong, it doesn't look focused, the band doesn't look like they're gelling here, it looks like four individuals standing next to each other as opposed to a gang and uh, Anton describes this in his uh, in his writing on here this is, it didn't feel like they were all in the same room together and although not planned as such um, these pictures are telling in that sense and it's a sharp contrast to what the, uh, the, the, the the pictures came back as so we've got effectively somewhere in the vaults a version of all that you can't leave behind that is generally regarded as not being particularly good now you can hear some of the songs or some of the versions of some of the songs on the 2004 box set, the complete U2, which was um, made available for download from YouTube's uh, for an enormous amount of money. Um, and the, it was the only way to get hold of a, a number of songs. And also um, it's now deleted. So the only place you can get hold of those songs really is on the uh, this compilation CD, Medium, Rare and Remastered, which was released through the band's fan club in 2000 and nine um and it's got uh tracks from 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 the how to dismantle an atomic bomb sessions it's got uh smile um xanax and wine which is an alternate version of fast cars all because of you uh native sun which is a, an early version of vertigo uh, an alternative version of yahweh and sometimes you can't make it on your own and uh i don't have access to the the production credits on this particular release um but you could probably take those six songs and you could put together an alternate version of how to dismantle an atomic bomb that wouldn't be quite so good. So let's say then that the band got how to dismantle an atomic bomb, they'd finished the album and they were ready to release it in late 2004. The first thing which any of us heard from the album um, was a song which you will undoubtedly know and you may not even like it. Uh, Vertigo. This is a, an American jukebox, 7-inch, I think. Um, now, Vertigo is a very, very important song in U2's canon. Um, and I'll explain why. But I can't really explain why without talking through the rest of the album. Um, because as a complete work of art, How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb is, is a, a very, very effective statement. Um, the lyrics on this are, are the best lyrics which I think Bono and Edge have probably ever ever really penned and they, they um, cover a number of, of subjects and themes which are all interwoven and wrapped around each other and quoted around each of the songs so for example um, the, there's a lot of songs around death, mortality, birth, um, God, religion, beliefs and so on and so forth and if we just pick out just one song from here let's pick out Vertigo because lo and, lo and behold that is the first song on the album um, let's pick out Vertigo and just go go through the, the, the lyrics that we've got there. And it's the opening track on the album, by the way, Vertigo. So it really is pinning its colours very, very clearly uh, to the mast. And I think it's probably one of one of the, the best lyrics which the band have ever done. So um, Vertigo is about a, uh, a crisis of faith that happens when someone is tempted by the devil. Um, and it's set inside a you know a fictional narrative where uh, they're, they're in a place called Vertigo, which, which Bono has described as a Mexican nightclub where you realise it's not that good and there's temptation that's around. 
around you. But also, it ties in with the theory that you don't quite know exactly where you are, you don't know exactly what's going on, and, and you've kind of lost sense of balance there, which is important. And it says, you know, hello, hello, I'm at a place called Vertigo, it's everything I wish I didn't know, except you give me something that I can feel. And the, the line about you give me something that I can feel is, is referred to in the first verse. Uh, and the first verse is, lights go down, it's dark, the jungle is your head can't rule your heart a feeling is so much stronger than a thought your eyes are wide and though your soul it can't be bought your mind can wander so let, let's go through the, those lyrics um because what we're talking about lights go down it's dark that's a nightclub the jungle is in your head it's about confusion and you don't really know what's going on and your head can't rule your heart so a feeling is so much stronger than a thought you know and it's very much around the power of emotion and belief as opposed to logic and, and science although that's referred to in a later song um but the feeling there is the thing that matters is that you give me something i can feel is repeated in the chorus so it's around belief and, and ethics and how, how all of these things kind of fit together um and then the the um the, there's also the line which says though your soul it can't be bought your mind can wander which is a direct reference to uh, c.s lewis's the screw tape letters um which also influenced the zoo tv tour around how um at, at the, there's a point in, in the screw tape letters which are what they're letters from a, an apprentice kind of demon through to the devil i think um and there's a bit where he said well i thought he was going to try and make a big spiritual breakthrough so i decided to make him hungry so he lost his his mind he lost his, his way his way of thought and and that is it, your soul can't be bought but your mind can wander and it, it's a direct kind of you know attribution or quotation from there um and and there's a, a whole bunch of, of other things that are in in the lyrics uh, to Vertigo. So later on, he goes, "All of this, all of this can be yours. Uh, just give me what I want, and nobody gets hurt." Now, there's a, a, a quotation uh, from the Bible, and um, because I'm not that familiar with the Bible, I have done some research on the internet, and you can now see that I've got the laptop very closely down here. And I think the section in 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 reference here is, yeah. Matthew 4.9, um, where I think the devil tempts uh, uh, a believer and says, all these things I will give to you if you will worship me. And it's around very much around the power of the payoff, around give me what I want and nobody gets hurt. Um, it, it sits alongside there. But then there's the next line which goes, I can feel your love teaching me how. Your love is teaching me how to kneel. And it's there, and, and you know, if you will fall down and worship me, um, if you kneel, I will give you all the things that you believe. But there's also um, a quotation from, from the Bible, which, if I am correct, is um, he who kneels before God can stand before anyone. And that's, I think, I'm, obviously I could be completely wrong here. I'm reading this off a, a web page, which is Ephesians 3.14. Um, they who kneel before God can stand before anybody. And, and it all kind of ties in together. Is around, the, you know, there's a devil's bargain. And, you know, the band are also very, very aware of the work of William Burroughs, by the way, um, who has a quote, which I'm sure is referenced in this in this song um now william burroughs appears in the video for last night on earth he also appears in the thanksgiving prayer which was used as the introduction to where the streets have no name on the zoo tv um telecast broadcast in 1992 um and william burroughs had a saying which is um if the devil offers you a bargain be flattered for it as a compliment and, and you know they can't have gone through all of this without at least being aware of and referring to that even if it's on a subconscious level so vertigo is about the power of temptation the power of belief the power of understanding and how you need to keep your your mind kind of absolutely clear and, and concentrate on what you can feel when logic science rationality words and all these things kind of can cloud you from what you truly believe and when you don't know what you actually believe i mean effectively your senses are lying to you and there you've got a, a kind of a thing of vertigo now with that four minute um kind of you know compacted cliff's notes version of why i think vertigo is one of the best u2 lyrics you'll be going yeah mate but the song rocks and it absolutely does it's got fantastic crunchy crunchy guitars it's it's got the kind of chorus that you can sing in the car um, and also by the way native sun which as i've mentioned before which appears on medium rare and remastered is an early version of vertigo with a completely different set of lyrics and melody and native sun is a far inferior version of the song now if native sun had been the first song uh, which had been released from the album 
Um, not many people, I think, would be talking so so obviously about how good the album is. Now, that's just the first song. And there's a whole bunch of other arguments um, around belief and ethics and morals, which are, which are ongoing throughout the rest of the album. And as I've said in a previous episode, um, you two took their songs about religion and instead of addressing them to god they, they then turn them into love songs and the you know the idea that god is love and then all the songs that that refer to love actually refer to you know god and belief and ethics and morals now the the second song on the album is miracle drug and i, I think miracle drug is, is one of the the finest um u2 songs ever um and it also kind of points back to vertigo with a line that is said love and logic keep us clear reason is on our side um, um then there's a, an element where where edge sings that's the last verse of the song it's one of my favorite bits of music of, of all time um when when edge sings beneath the noise and below the din i hear a voice it's whispering in science and in medicine i was a stranger and you took me in and 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 that that kind of definitely um comes from i think it is uh Oh, I can't even remember which bit it's in now. Um, but there is there is a, a Bible verse which is very very clear around that, um, and which is you know I was a stranger and you took me in, um, and it's also actually uh, you know I held the hand of the devil in the night. It was you know, it was warm, which comes from I still haven't found what I'm looking for. So it's all around things like temptation uh, and around you know God and everything that goes with it. Now, whilst I refer back to to Vertigo. Um, I think there's a there's a, a a couple of things which I'm going going to say. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I mentioned Matthew four point eight four point nine, um, and that's where the devil is trying to tempt Jesus after the forty days and the forty nights uh, in the desert, um, and that's the temptation which runs all the way through the album. It's about eschewing that temptation. Is you know, um, I was a stranger and you took me in. Is is uh, you know a, a huge huge part of the album. Also, by the way, there is. Um, there, there, someone's come up with a theory that actually the whole of Vertigo is Bono confessing to be a Satanist and a member of the Illuminati. Um, as I've mentioned previously, occasionally you have to press the bullshit button. That's bullshit. OK, um, and so that is just Vertigo. Now, Vertigo, obviously being the first single from the album, uh, was a pretty big hitter and the rest of the album is is pretty uh pretty important as well so it's it's one of u 2s biggest selling albums um it's one of their biggest albums it's got a lot in the download stage it came with its own ipod it came with a huge amount of extra material now this is the the american uh book version of the album i was in america on the day it came out so i bought the american version which had the deluxe edition and the only way for me to get the track fast cars was to buy this version uh, as opposed to buy any other version so we've got i'm going to go through the the packaging that we've got here it you know has a kind of military feel about it it's got the explosion on the back and it comes in a you know um a nice little box that's, that's dvd shaped and we've got this here now quickly going to go through uh there's a lot of quotes in in this book and it's really important actually if you've got an opportunity to find the art for this you know it's got like for i am death the destroyer of worlds uh and that's that's from um that was cited by j rock robert oppenheimer as i have become death shatter of worlds on the occasion of the, of the detonation of the first test of an atomic bomb uh in in 1945 and how to dismantle an atomic bomb you know the, the 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 title and boy those titles are getting a bit wordy now uh was very much around you know the death of, of bonner's father who he described as a you know a force of nature or an atomic presence and and one that needed to be uh, you know this mountain carefully as opposed to 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 let loose um you know and, and the art that we've got in 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 this version of the album by the way is it really helps create a full work of art which which bono kind of refers to actually in regards to people who buy cds as buying effectively the hardcover version of an album the download being you know the paperback and referring to people buying the cds as, as people that, that bought you know a, a package that was a work of art as opposed to just a record with a 20 page uh, booklet that was that was with it within it so um we've got uh, you know lots of, of references in here um we've got kind of like you know, things about you know, food heat first aid clothing you know things that tie into maslow's hierarchy 
of of needs. Um, this, by the way, is is I think lyrics from Mercy, uh, which is. Um, Love believes me when I lie, love puts the blue back in my eye. Love is the end of history, the enemy of misery. And, and Mercy is a, a very famous uh, U2 song that was performed live a handful of times in 2010. Um, and also it was a song which was used um, and leaked from, from the sessions. Um, now one could debate how... How that came out, was it deliberately leaked or was it, I, I have no idea. Um, uh, but we've also got, I think, some, some other uh, lyrics that are in here somewhere. And, well, it's, it's a really nice package. It's a lovely work of art, How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb, as a, as a release. It all, um, there are two editions of it, uh, one of which comes with uh, the CD. Um, one of which comes with a DVD, which is in the, the, the fancy edition here, but also in a slightly more streamlined version of the album, uh, which was released in Europe. Um, OK, so with all that to one side, uh, what we have with How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb is also an album that is, in my opinion, much, much better than All That You Can't Leave Behind. Because All That You Can't Leave Behind, as I've previously mentioned, is top-loaded with hits. So it's got four big hits to start off with, um, and then it kind of takes a slow descent down. So as I said, it was sequenced like Big Black's songs about fucking, where the, the songs got worse and worse as the album went on. Whereas How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb is, is constructed like a work of art. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's got a sequence that works very, very well. And the only thing I'd change about the sequence or how to dismantle an atomic bomb would be to put City of Blinding Lights as the opening track on the album because it's got a long, slow, gentle introduction that brings in each one of the instruments slowly and is a very, very optimistic song. And then you, you go can go vertigo, miracle drug. Uh, sometimes you can't make it on your own, closing side one with love and peace or else. Now, sometimes that you can't make it on your own is um, a song that hasn't been performed live for 15 years now. It's a very, very important U2 song. Uh, an early version of the song existed in 2001 um, that was recorded around about the time of the death of Bono's father. Um, and then later the, the section was added to it that completed the song, um, which is a heartbreaking line, which is, it's you when I look in the mirror and it's you when I pick up the phone and sometimes I can't make it on your own. And, you know, I really felt those looks very, very closely at the time the album came out because it reminded me of the loss that I had experienced in terms of some difficult relationships and the loss of a parent in my life as well. So I can't hear that song without thinking about my parents uh, or my, my, my now deceased mother. Um, and there is also uh, a line in there which is, you're the reason that the opera is in me. You know, we take things from our parents and we take them forward into the future, whatever the future may look like um, and, and however that might be. Um, I always thought that sometimes you can't make it on your own is, is one of the first songs really um, and, and you two are really addressing the circle of life here, um, which is that there's, there's, you know, there's birth, there's death, there's mortality, there's parenthood. Uh, and there's a time where you, you are both a child and a parent, um, especially if you are a parent. If you're not, of course, that's not really relevant. But if you're a parent, you're both a child of, of, of a parent and you're a parent of a child. And there's a circle of life that goes around like um, and it's addressed in the lyric to Miracle Drug, which is freedom has a scent, like the top of a newborn baby's head. Uh, and it's also in songs like Sometimes You Can't Make It On Your Own uh, and also All Because Of You. And the lyric to All Because Of You is, is really important as well, because it, it's very, you know, there's a reason that that song um, sits in the set next to I Will Follow on the most recent tour. Uh, and the reason being is that, you know, there's a lyric in there which is, um, let me see, I'm alive, I'm being born, I've just arrived, I'm at the door of the place that I started back, start, place that I started out from and I want back inside, all because of you, I am all because of you. you know, and that's, that's a, a lyric written to, to your parents, really, and it's saying, you know, I'm, I exist because of decisions that you made. Um, and it's all around a very circular lyric. Um, now, All Because of You is followed up with um, a man and a woman, and I'm sure that's not coincidental, though I think a man and a woman is a very binary song, um, so it doesn't necessarily reflect the shades of grey that come inside things like gender identity or um, 
around you know the fact that love can be between two men two women um a man and two women two women and a man anything like that you know it's, it's got a very binary on off digital approach to a relationship um which which feels a little alienating if you're not 100 percent hetero uh, but that's a completely different conversation um the album also has uh, Crumbs From Your Table, which is not played live very often. In fact, I think they play Crumbs From Your Table and Fast Cars because of uh, requests from people um, that they met before the show saying, can you play this song? And they're like, well, we didn't even know anybody liked these songs. Um, and, and Crumbs From Your Table ties into Bono's activism that he'd been very, very clear about um, and, uh, in, in his life around trying to reduce inequality and poverty and debt. Um, and then, you know, the album, I think maybe one step closer, should come, at the, come as the last song on the album, but the last song on the album, on the, on the, the vinyl edition of it at least, I think, is, is Yahweh, which, which takes its name from um, a mispronunciation of, of the, the name Jehovah. Um, and I think tradition was that you couldn't pronounce that word, and so therefore the way in which people could pronounce that word became... Uh, lost to history and so Yahweh became effectively a replacement or or an alternative version of that in the same way that you know language changes and evolves over time um now for Yahweh let's see if I can find the lyric here um it's it's very clearly a song around somebody that's lost and looking for direction and looking for a you know a degree of uh, of spiritual understanding uh, you know take these shoes click clacking down some dead end street take these shoes and make them fit um and take this soul stand it in some in some skin and bones and take this soul and make it sing now as a singer if you can't sing you, you know you you've not got your purpose so i think maybe the the, the the lyric around this is very clearly around looking for spiritual direction and guidance and you know a path through the events that are happening around you so for example the lights go down it's dark um, as, as vertigo starts off so the opening lyric of vertigo is very much around being you know, surrounded by darkness and confusion and not knowing where you are and at the end of the album it, it also picks up that thread around you know lead me and, and show me show me the way um, which of course is reflected also in the album War and the song 40. Uh, it's all a big tapestry of, of, of songs around belief, um, ethics, religion and, and all those things. Which I wasn't it wasn't the direction I was expecting to go in today. Um, but you know, as, as you probably noticed, I think with my mouth open, it's a very dangerous place to be. Uh, now, moving on from, from the album itself, because I think I've talked lyrically about the album... Uh, in in a multitude of ways, there's a number of extra formats and releases uh, which came out. So Vertigo, as you've previously seen, the seven-inch single here, American Jukebox copy, uh, was released in the UK uh, as uh, three digital versions. So there's a CD single here, which is backed with Are You Gonna Wait Forever. There's another CD single that's backed with Jackknife Lee remix of Vertigo and Neon Lights. And there's a DVD single, uh, which contains the video and uh, an, another remix. And it's not all that in a bag of chips, actually, the DVD singles. I have no, under, no idea why people even release DVD singles. They saw them as afterthoughts. So actually, probably the best physical format of Vertigo is, uh, is this 10-inch single, which is a promo. Uh, now, clearly, the band had a fair amount of money because you're doing a promo 10-inch single uh, with an inner sleeve. And everything that goes with it, you're really putting some money into this and you're using the 10 inch mix as, as your main remix on, on, on the single. Um, this contains the 7 inch and 10 inch versions of the song by Jack Knife Lee, um, who's a producer um, who the band have worked with, also works with REM and, and a number of other people. Now, the second single from the album um, is uh, one I've mentioned before. Sometimes you can't make it on your own here's the dvd single uh has a very has this picture on the back i think this picture should probably be the front picture actually on songs of experience um but uh it's got uh, a live version of sometimes from from the band studio it's got the video for vertigo uh and it's got a trent reznor remix of vertigo which by the way the trent reznor remix is absolutely fantastic and it should be better known um, now the the other thing that we've got is we've got two CD singles here. So we've got um, 
uh, a remix or re-edit, a slightly different tempo of sometimes that you can't make it on your own, and uh, a Jackknife Lee alternative version of Fast Cars, which if you don't have Fast Cars, um, you don't have to buy the album now, you can get the single. Um, uh, but also Fast Cars exists in, in the form known as Xanax and Wine on here. So the band used the extra songs from the recording sessions as B-sides, and you got a lot of alternative versions at the time. Uh, there's also this CD single, which features um, the remix of Sometimes You Can't Make It, a Redanka power mix of uh, Vertigo, and uh, a recording of Ave Maria by Bono. And Bono wrote some extra lyrics for Ave Maria, and I can't remember which book they're in. I think they're in this book, Bono by Bono, um, where he, he, he talks about those lyrics, and I have got a bit of paper which should point out which the lyrics are, which, is, which he wrote new lyrics for Ave Maria, which is, Where is the justice in this world? The wicked make so much noise, the righteous stay oddly still. With no wisdom, all of the riches in the world will leave us poor tonight, and strength is not without humility. It's weakness, an untreatable disease, and war is always the choice of the chosen who will not have to fight. You know, and, and so Ave Maria, you might think, oh, it's just him doing a, you know, a, an old hymn, but it's you know a new casting of the song, and only of course Bono would have uh, enough chance power to go. Oh, do you know, what? I think God got the lyrics wrong. I'm going to do them a little bit better here. So uh, you know, when we're talking about the the album, and um, there's some some kind of just bits and bobs which which you kind of get from from this book. It's really important to to read this book if you get an opportunity to do it. Um, is that you know Bono talks about um, how, for example, um, a day without me and stuck in a moment you can't get out of both deal with, with suicide and death, but also how sometimes you can't make it on your own deals with the same subject it, it is around, you know, when people are, are young and you play with the idea of mortality and you think, well, I'm going to live forever. Thanks, Noel. Uh, but also you kind of come to the point and realisation that you aren't and what do you do about that? Um, ultimately, you know, um, in the end, the love that you make is the same as the love you take. I think is, is uh, was probably I think the last words on the last Beatles studio recording. I could be totally wrong. I'm not quite sure. So, in Europe, uh, taking another slight turn, uh, sometimes you, um, how to dismantle an atomic bomb was released as a standard CD and DVD without a big fancy book that went next to it. Because I prefer this photo to the photo that's on the cover of the album. I've used this photo on the front, uh, but there's a DVD that comes with the album which features um, three versions of songs recorded during the band's uh, extra version. So acoustic versions of Sometimes You Can't Make It On Your Own um, and Vertigo and studio versions of Crumbs From Your Table and Sometimes You Can't Make It On Your Own as well. Um, I don't like the cover to the album. I have, an, I have made an alternative cover for it uh, because in my arrogance, that's exactly the type of thing that I do. So I'm going to show you very quickly what I've mocked up, what I prefer my, my cover of the album would look like, which is this. Um, I think that's a better cover. I think it's funnier. I think it's got a little bit more mystery in it. Um, I think that the cover to How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb is probably the worst cover that you two have. It is a very, very bland photograph of four geezers sitting on a, on a wall and it does nothing in terms of selling the mystery of the album or the wonders that are contained within um, it really does so also uh, in 2019 a remastered version of the album was released um, and it was a, a colored vinyl version of it was released as well which was only available from HMV and limited to one per customer naturally I got one because I'm a record collector and that's the kind of guy that I am now, sometimes you can't make it on your own. Didn't get a vinyl release uh, in any official format. In fact, the closest thing to an official vinyl format we got was actually the Vertigo remix, which was a, um, a remix 12-inch, which was promotional only, of the B-sides. Uh, this, again, has an inner sleeve. Um, clearly no shortage of money in Camp U2, uh, but it's also got the Trent Reznor remix on vinyl. And, and the Trent Reznor remix of Vertigo, I've already mentioned it, is absolutely fantastic and well worth tracking down. 
Um, I'm clearly not going to have enough time to go through the tour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the last two singles from the album. Um, and the second, well, the third single from the album is City of Blinding Lights, um, which was originally a song that was uh, recorded and written during the pop sessions, but the band couldn't quite get the track to work. So they went back to it during the sessions for how to dismantle an atomic bomb. In these days, um, if you remember the band's mailing list, you got a free bit of cardboard that you were sent that you could put the CD singles in. Uh, and the CD singles uh, and DVD singles contained, let's think there, uh, uh, an alternate mix of All Because of You, which was the Kilohertz Fly Mix, which has a new guitar and bass on it by somebody that isn't a member of U2. And it's got two live tracks recorded at, Seller, uh, at the Stop Sellerfield concert in Manchester in 1992. Um, there's a DVD single which contains the video for City of Blinding Lights live at Brooklyn Bridge. It's the first live material released from the tour. And the video for Sometimes You Can't Make It On Your Own, but not the video for City of Blinding Lights, uh, which is a little strange. Now, City of Blinding Lights is, I think, widely regarded as one of the best U2 songs. It's one of the songs that they played the most live. I think they played it on every tour apart from apart from the Joshua Tree Tour in 2017, which I'll address in uh, another video, because of course what the world needs is more of me talking about you too. And then All Because of You, which was the B-side of the previous single, now becomes a single in its own right. This was released around about February 2006, and again two CDs and a DVD. Um, and I don't think I've taken this out for 15 years, so maybe it won't come out of the box, at which point you'll just have to pretend that I genuinely have got the CDs there. There you are, that's the right way up, um, which feature uh, a live song, uh, which is uh, She's a Mystery to Me, live from Brooklyn, which was the last live performance of She's a Mystery to Me by U2, which they wrote for Roy Orbison. Um, and also features a live version of Miss Sarajevo from Milan and an acoustic re-recording of A Man and a Woman. Uh, the DVD single features... Um, I hate that word, DVD single. Features a video to All Because of You and the video for City of Blinding Lights and the studio version, or the studio mix, uh, remix 7-inch version of City of Blinding Lights. But since there wasn't a 7-inch, having a 7-inch on there or a 7-inch edit is pretty weird. Now... There's one more release, uh, which I haven't kind of brought up, which is uh, the City of Blinding Lights promotional 12 inch. Uh, and this features two remixes of City of Blinding Lights that you can't get anywhere else. So those remixes are the Phones PDA in NYC mix, remixed by Paul Epworth, and the Paradise Soul vocal version, uh, mixed by Paradise Soul, alongside the Kilohertz. Uh, fly vocal mix of All Because of You. Um, again, promo only. Not quite sure why this didn't come out, apart from the fact that you could only have three four bats uh, count towards the UK chart positions. Uh, but I think this is a great 12 inch. It's really wasted being a promotional only 12 inch. It should have got a, a far, far bigger release. Now, there's one more single, which sort of, maybe, perhaps, but didn't actually come out from the album, uh, which is Original of the Species, which was re recorded and had uh, new orchestra parts added to it and I think the band added some new parts to it as well uh, and that became uh, a promotional CD uh, sent to radio but you couldn't buy it, it wasn't released as a single which is a great shame actually uh, because uh, when the band's next compilation album came out which will be the subject of one of the next upcoming episodes it doesn't have original of the species on it so there's no way that you can actually check and see if original of the species as a single version with all the extra work that had taken place to it had been released. Now that brings us to the end of the um, How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb period. Uh, the band were fairly busy, they did an awful lot of touring. We're going to go through that in a, a future episode where we're going to talk through the band's touring, the Vertigo tour, uh, which by the way was uh, very well represented in the field of DVDs, um, and the U2 18 singles compilation which is what happened next alongside uh, the publication of the tie-in book U2 by U2 which means pretty soon I'm going to run out of bits to quote from this um, and that's going to be pretty strange isn't it uh, but there you are so how to dismantle an atomic bomb 
I think, as I said earlier, I listened to it today for the first time in a couple of years. And it's really shut up in my estimations now. It's probably about halfway in my list of U2 albums. Or it was definitely in the bottom third before I listened to it today. Um, I think lyrically it's it's a great album. It's dense. The songs play next to each other and they, they work back to and refer back to each other. So the start and the end songs kind of refer to similar themes. Um, they have the themes of mortality, death, parenthood, ethics, belief religion and and how to kind of you know how to navigate your way through the world and part of that in the title how to dismantle an atomic bomb is also kind of like i think an allusion to saying how do you cope with you know the 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 youth or the anger and the confusion and and the sense of loss and and not knowing your place in the world when you have a youth how do you deal with that how do you dismantle that that because certainly when i was 17 or 18 I was really angry. I listened to a lot of angry music. I felt emotions very, very, very intently. Um, and I think part of it is around uh, almost like a code for maturity, really, is to say, well, how do you dismantle the atomic bomb that is your own emotions? How do you deal with, with that destructive power? And what do you do to convert it into something, you know, a power that can be used for good? Uh, and I was thinking earlier on today, which is in itself not really worth mentioning, um, about how you know if you're falling to the untrained eye it might look like you're flying and how to dismantle an atomic bomb is about how you turn a power from something that could be very destructive to actually something that's very constructive and it's about taking that that power and that potential and converting it into something that can change the world for the better um it's a great u2 album actually i mean it's much better than i uh, than i initially thought when it came out um it's aged very well um, I like it a lot. I've, I've got a newfound appreciation for it from listening to it today. Uh, and every video that I do, I listen to the album before I talk about it to make sure I haven't missed something. Especially if it's an album that I know very, very, very well. Because I think, well, I know all the songs on there. I'm not going to change my mind. But sometimes you need to come back to it and experience it again. And go, right, now that I am this age. And by the way, I'm about the age that uh, Bono was when he released the album. Um, yeah, I'm about that age now so the things that that maybe the the band were experiencing at the time that they wrote and recorded this album are probably about the type of things i'm starting to experience in my own life you know things like uh, death separation growing old uh growing bald suddenly i can't hide it all behind a hat those type of things um and i'm going to wrap up here i think that's the right thing to do um, uh, the next episode where I talk about you 2 I will be talking about the Vertigo Tour, I'll be talking about the book, and U2-18, the singles. Uh, but I don't quite know when that's going to be. Um, as usual, don't be a dick in the comments. If, you're, you know, if you've got questions, queries, or anything like that, ask away. I will post uh, links to um, some of the, the audio material that you can find some of the b-sides and bits and bobs like that as well so that you can experience those um and it's been uh it's been good thank you for your time and your interest and i will um catch up with you again uh, as we go ever further into lockdown 3d the revenge um see you all again love and peace or else bye <laughs>